Hi, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. I'm Frank Hutchison. And I'm Emily Geddes. And welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. Today we're continuing our discussion of beer, which if you've listened to our earlier episodes, I encourage you to go back and check those out if you haven't, began in ancient Mesopotamia over 12,000 years ago. That beer was really sort of a thick pork. They'd eat it because it was food. But they didn't eat it normally. Because it had been left out, sometimes things would get into it, and they have, might have some and way of... leaves and rocks and... Pleasant whatever things. Delightful stuff. things. And so they developed the straw. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. The straw had its origins in beer. And, you know, that was like 5,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. This all happened in what is commonly called the Fertile Crescent. Today, we think of this as Iran, Iraq, Syria, and what we call the Middle East. What you had was a lot of city-states, and these were not nations. They were just like small cities, probably anywhere from five to 10,000 people at the largest. There's a whole bunch of them along the Euphrates, and the earliest one that we have a written record of is Samaria. That was from 3400 BCE, before the Common Era, because they were the first ones to start writing. But we know that beer, from archaeological evidence, goes back to 12,000 uh, years ago. So that's like 10,000 BCE. So about 7,000 years before we had writing, we had beer. This beer is being made at basically the family level. The women, as they're making bread, they're also making beer. Well, yeah, it's, it's really synonymous with each other. If, if you're making bread, you're also making beer. They don't happen without each other. That's right. It was something that the woman did in the home while the men were off either raising the grain mm-hmm. or taking care of the animals or out hunting even, fighting the wars, whatever they were doing. As the Sumerians come along now, and now they're able to have writing, and you have like the first written record we have is a receipt for beer. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yes. the first, it's it's a receipt. We discussed previously, a merchant named Alulu sold someone five silas of his best beer, which is about four and a half liters. And it was actually marked to that degree. So silas is about 0.9 liters. Mm-hmm. The Sumerians, in this time frame, no one city-state would have dominance for very long. Mm-hmm. Generally, maybe a hundred years or so. Samaria is one of the most famous. You have women producing the beer. You start having it being incorporated into religion and the social life because it's so pervasive. And what you have is the attitude that was expressed by Benjamin Franklin the best. Beer is proof that God loves us. Well, yeah, they, they really viewed it as a gift of the gods because it revolutionized their society. People could live longer. They survived longer. You could get bigger bang for your buck when you spend a day making food, which meant people had time to do all these other things. And when something becomes that important, it becomes institutionalized into your mythology. So beer went from just being this piece of food to being an integral part of Sumerian mythology and religion. Uh, we find evidence of it in... I would point out here that we call it mythology, but for them, it was religion. Yes. For example, in the uh, famous Sumerian poem, Inanna and the God of Wisdom, it talks about how these two deities were drinking beer together, and the God of Wisdom became so drunk that he gave the the human beings the laws of civilization, uh, which, I mean, these two things were so completely tied together. Uh, we also see it in the hymn to Ninkasa, which was a song of praise that, that people sang for centuries about the goddess of beer, Ninkasi. It actually even includes the first recipe for beer. Sometime about eight- Well, it was finally written down, but it existed in the song long before that. Yes. Well, and talking about how beer was such an integral part of their society, they really saw it as this civilizing influence. Mm -hmm. And you can see that from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which anybody who's suffered through middle school has probably (laughs) had to read. It was considered the world's first great literary work. Uh, Gilgamesh was a Sumerian king who ruled around 2700 BCE. And this elaborate myth grew up around him and his adventures, particularly with his friend Enkidu. You can see the civilizing Mm -hmm. influence of beer. So he starts off as this wild man running naked in the wilderness, but this young woman introduces him to the ways of civilization. She takes him to this shepherd's village, which was kind of considered the lowest rung on the ladder of civilization. But She'd eventually work him up to the high culture of the city. It was Shamhat was her name, wasn't it? I believe so, yes. yes. So the passage in Gilgamesh says, they placed food in front of him, they placed beer in front of him, and Kidu knew nothing about eating bread for food and of drinking beer he had not been taught. The young woman spoke to Enkidu, saying, Eat the food, Enkidu, it is the way one lives. 
drank the beer as it is the custom of the land. And Kidu ate the food until he was sated. He drank the beer, seven jugs, with an wow. exclamation point, and became expansive and sang with joy. He was elated and his face glowed. He splashed his shaggy body with water and rubbed himself with oil and turned into a human. So in this poem, drinking the beer, eating the food, and then washing himself, he becomes human. Beer was really seen as this, this civilizing influence and it, I find it very interesting that it's a young woman who introduces this to mm -hmm. him, considering the, the primary central part that women played in the production of beer mm -hmm. in this early time period. Because women were the brewers. I mean, absolutely, women did the brewing. This was not a man's industry at all. Now, because of um, this major influence on civilization and with the religion that we've talked about a little bit, the surplus was often seen as uh, something that you gave back to the gods. It was mm -hmm. an offering to the gods, um, begging them to allow this good thing to continue. And where do you give an offering for the gods? The you temples. give it to the temples. Mm -hmm. So the, the priests of the temple in, in particular uh, really became very instrumental in collecting these offerings, which really turned they were supposed to be these you know free will offerings but they kind of campaign became more uh, compulsory taxes mm -hmm. to the temples but then the temples could use these either to support the bureaucracy of the temple the priests that, that mm -hmm. worked at the temple or to trade for other goods or services these were kind of the first public works that were mm -hmm. built were funded through these surpluses of beer and mm -hmm. bread and grain. Because the workers were paid beer I and think bread. We said, yeah, the workers were paid in beer and bread. Bread and beer became the, their payment, their currency. Mm -hmm. It was money, um, but they could pay them to work on irrigation systems, construction of public buildings. These public works were funded by these surplus payments given to the temple as offerings to the gods. Because at that time, there was really no separation between church and state. Mm -hmm. It was all one uh, united system. E exactly. There was no separation of church and state. And we really see this come to fruition when the Babylonians took over, became to power in Mesopotamia around the 18th century BC. And the first great king, Hammurabi, uh, commercialized beer under his reign. But we really see that in the laws that he wrote. If you've heard of the Code of Hammurabi, I think we all had to study that at some point in mm -hmm. middle school. The very first codified yep. laws mm -hmm. that we have. It's about, what is it, 280 odd laws? 282. 282 Although laws. Although, I think 66 through 99 have been lost. Okay. Um, they were written on these 12 tablets, and they're our first real written code. And not surprisingly, beer is and regulation is a big part of that. Um, there are three specifically... Numbers 108, 109, and 110 that directly relate to beer, including 108 that says, if a tavern keeper, which is interesting, tavern keeper was a feminine word, the tavern keepers were women, does not accept corn according to gross weight and payment of drink, but takes money, and the price of the drink is less than that of the corn, she shall be convicted and thrown into the water. What this means is that if the women who controlled the taverns had gone from being a cottage industry where they made it at home to women controlling the commercial sale of beer, if she cheated someone by watering down the beer, then she could be drowned. That's how seriously they took the subject. It goes all the way into if people conspire, if some people decide to do a crime at the house of a tavern keeper and they don't intervene, they can also be put to death. But the most interesting one for me is number 110 which directly relates to the priestesses. 110 says, if a sister of a god, which is one of the priest priestesses of Ninkasi, who we talked about before, if she open a tavern or enter a tavern to drink, then shall this woman be burned to death, which sounds pretty extreme. But when you consider that the priestesses were part of this, really the, the civil service at the time, because there's no separation between church and state, the priests, the rulers were all together funding these public works. And priestesses had the sacred responsibility to brew beer. They weren't against priestesses drinking, but they didn't want them to do it in the same way a common woman would or profit off of their sacred duty. This is really one of the first conflict of interest laws. It kept someone who had a sacred responsibility from being profaned. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that too. And that eventually became part of it, that they would be profaned if they took the sacred responsibility and commercialized it. Now, at this point, beer was also becoming very diversified. Yes. There were many different kinds of beer at this point, many different qualities, many different flavors. 
I found one reference to uh, the different kinds of beer in Mesopotamia from the third millennium BCE that lists over 20 different kinds, including fresh beer, dark beer, fresh dark beer, strong beer, red brown beer, light beer, and pressed beer. Mm -hmm. Just a few of the different kinds that they had. Mm -hmm. And they had great names. Aren't those fun? Those are fun. Well, and what this really is, it, it's an outgrowth of this female-controlled industry of brewing. It started as women in their homes making beer as a, just a byproduct of making bread. The two were synonymous. And eventually, as surpluses collected, they would sell it. And we don't know exactly how it happened, but by the time of Hammurabi, women controlled the taverns. They were the ones who were selling beer commercially. And when you have a lot of tavern keepers, there's competition. So specialties grow up. You have to have a way of competing in the market and distinguishing yourself. It's also real interesting that if you look at Hollywood movies that depict ancient mm -hmm. civilizations, they always show the tavern keeper as a man. Mm -hmm. you now, the innkeeper that caused Joseph and Mary right. to be in the stable was a man. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. We have some very, very poor assumptions about that time period. This was a completely female-dominated industry. And while like the priests collected it at the temple, they weren't brewing the beer. The priestesses and the everyday woman were brewing it. Beer keeps being this catalyst for development. We see that it was a catalyst for laws, for trade, for, for writing, for mm -hmm. accountancy, mm -hmm. for... Yeah. But that also means that the catalyst for civilization was women running businesses. And we'll talk about more aspects mm -hmm. of beer oh. in our next episode. Yeah. And eventually that actually escalated. But once the uh, Mesopotamia produced so much beer, they had to trade it somewhere. And they did. They started trading with Egypt, which was the next civilization to, that we know of to really embrace beer, but not the only one. One of the things we found when we were looking at the history that's still very Eurocentric is everyone talks about beer going from Mesopotamia to Egypt, but it also went to China at the same time. And we'll talk about that some more in our next two episodes. If you'd like to learn more about the subject that we discussed today, you can find multimedia content, links to articles we discussed, and videos on our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business and on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening.